Well, my wife and I, uh, a week or so ago, ended a couple of weeks uh, on, uh, on a little tour of the Southwest down Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, coming back up through Nevada, and eventually cutting across the Sierras and getting back home. And um, as an introduction to my sermon today, uh, I'd like to ask how many of you know the country western singer Willie Nelson? All of you familiar with Willie? Who could not have run across Willie somewhere? Well, I'm going to call on Willie Nelson to introduce my sermon, and we're going to play about oh, 20 or 30 seconds of a song that he made famous, and then we'll tell you how this song applies to, uh, uh, to what we're going to talk about today. So, Grant or whomever, if you can play about 20 or 30 seconds, I'll give you the cue when to stop. I know you wanted to hear the rest of it. It's better than listening to me, but that's too bad. You'll have to do that on your own time. Well, Willie Nelson talked about going roads and seeing places where he'd never been. And in that way, uh, Willie Nelson and I have an affinity because I love to take a road trip and I love to see roads and places I've never been. And always along the way, there are the people the people. Because you see, I could just drive on a road out in the middle of what most people would call nowhere and just be perfectly content just looking at God's good creation. But when you stop along the way and you meet people here and there, then those people also have lessons to be learned and things they can tell you about life and about God and about his love. And so I would like to tell you, as the title of my sermon is, People on the Road because I encountered some people on the road and I want to zero in on them, few of them at least anyway, and uh, let's see what we, can, uh, what we can learn and appreciate about the great God who created us through these people. But to introduce this, I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 1 with me and let's see something uh, to put human beings in a proper context. Uh, Genesis 1, of course, uh, talks about the early stages of God's creation, the uh, seven days of creation. And in verse 26, we pick it up where God said, Let us make people in our image to be like ourselves, and they will be masters over all life, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the livestock, wild animals and small animals. And so God created people in his own image, God patterned them after himself, male and female, he created them. Now, I think there's a few obvious things that human beings don't share with God, uh, namely all of his, you know, eternity, all of his sovereignty, all of his power, all of his knowledge of everything that goes on, past, present, or future. I mean, th those are the obvious takeaways. Well, what is it that we share with God that God was zeroing in on here about this image, this image of God? Well, we were made, to put it in a nutshell, to be capable of sharing in a rational and a moral and a spiritual fellowship with God. That's a mouthful. A rational, a moral, and a spiritual fellowship with God. And man was made to know God and to have a personal and endless fellowship with God. You remember David alluded in one of the songs that he sang that God is a lot of things, but God is also our friend. Now, that, that is, that is mind-blowing. This past week I saw on this um, production that the PBS puts out called Nova, and they had one about uh, uh, neutrinos, I think is the word, and about these tiny little particles. Well, I guess you could call them particles because they finally determined they had mass because they could change and, and so on. And as I looked at this, I said to myself, 
I can't take this in. This is beyond me about how this whole universe is put together and how matter is made and everything else. And I just said, God, you are too great. There's just too much to comprehend. And you, your mind just kind of freezes up. And yet that same God with all that power and all that creativity and all that wonder about him said, you're my friend. 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 And he meant it. And he sent his son down to this earth. And Jesus said to his disciples, you are my friends. You call me master and Lord. And that's good, he said. But I am also here as your friend. And I'll tell you, when, when that concept about God truly began to sink into my feeble brain, uh, I... I forgot the legalism. I forgot all the ten points to this and seven points to that and how to pray and all the rest. And I just decided that when I sit down with my devotionals every morning, I say, good morning, God. Yes, my master and my Lord, but my friend. Let's have a cup of coffee together. And I picture that statement, I believe it's in Revelation chapter 3, where Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, and if you'll open up the door, I'll come in and we will dine, sup, share food, a meal, a cup of coffee, whatever. And we will do it because we are friends. And Jesus came to this earth and modeled what a friend would look like. And that's the way he treated people. Everybody was his friend. Everybody had potential. Let's see a little bit of that in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And there's an account here in the early ministry of Jesus where we find Jesus in a synagogue. And uh, we pick it up in chapter 4 and starting in verse 16. When he, Jesus, came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read the scriptures. And the scroll containing the messages of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him and he unrolled the scroll to a place where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released that the blind will see and that the downtrodden will be freed from their oppressors and the time of the Lord's favor has come. Now, I want you to think of this world in which we live about the people that are not only poor physically, they don't have much, but they're poor spiritually, they're poor mentally, they have terrible self-images. They are addicted to various things that are doing them no good. And they're just in bad need of help. And Jesus said, I love those people. I came to minister to those people. I came to give those people some hope. And I came to die for those people. And to tell them that there's going to come a time when they're going to be released. And they're going to see life as it ought to be seen. And they're going to be freed from their oppressors. Now all that has not taken place by any means yet. Because a good part of the world doesn't comprehend what the message of Jesus is. And of course in its fullness when Christ returns and literally makes all that work. But for those along the way especially those that we that are called and the chosen of God can come in contact with, we have an opportunity to do just exactly what Jesus said he was due, to shed a little bit of something good to the downtrodden and to tell captives to whatever it may be they're captive to that there's a way that they can be released and to live our lives as a continual witness to help these people. 
Okay, so with those couple of scriptures as a background, now let's go to some people on the road. I had to start out my road trip to get anywhere by going down, to me, the most boring stretch of highway on God's good earth, and that's I-5 going south. Uh, how many times I've gone I-5 south? And I've got to tell you, you know, you, you go down through the Central Valley of California on I-5, and it's a rich agricultural area. But it nearly broke my heart as to what the drought is doing to agriculture in California. Whole areas that would have been planted in a crop were just lying in weeds because there was no water. There were whole orchards that had been bulldozed and piled up to be burned because there was no water to keep them alive. And, and it just, man, you, you could see the effects of the drought as you went south and, and saw what it was doing to agriculture because there's only so much to go around and when it runs out and there's no more to irrigate with, you have to make choices. What are we going to keep and what are we going to let go? And uh, just that observation as we went. But our first stop was an old friend named Jim Roberts. I think many of you maybe know at least of Jim Roberts. He was over here in the Bay Area and San Francisco and Oakland area for a number of years. And uh, Jim and I go way back to the 1960s when we were in college together. And he and his wife Hazel, and uh, I think after college he went into, uh, um, what was it, uh, the mailing, uh, data, I don't know, all kinds of stuff down there in Pasadena that he did for a number of years until finally that was greatly downsized and he was sent out into the field ministry. But this time, going down to see Jim was with a little bit of a heavy heart because our visit coincided only three or four days after he had buried his wife. And uh, in fact, as I called up Jim and I said, look, if this is a bad time, you know, just let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll do this another time. But he said to me, oh, no, 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 you come. Please, please come. I look forward to your visit more now than I would have otherwise. And my visit with Jim Roberts with my wife, again, it, it, it taught me something that, um, that human beings, I, I guess, has as a gift that they can share with other human beings, particularly if it's bounded together by the truth of God. And that is, even in the times of grief, when we lose a loved one, somebody we've been married to for nearly 50 years, as in Jim's case, you can go and talk with that person and share life and let them air their griefs in whatever way that they want to air them, talk about what they want to talk about or not talk about, and you can literally give a service to someone that, as Jesus said in Luke 4, is poor from the point of view of their state of mind is one of grief, and one of loss, and one of a need for comfort that Jesus talked about here in Luke chapter 4. And so we shared some times together. Uh, he had some old friends over. I think you remember the Stonics. Uh, Ed uh, Stonic came up and visited uh, with his wife. He's a birder. Just ask, you know, Dan Cook about the Stonics, you know, birder. And then there was another couple, the Helshers. They came over to Jim's house. And what am I doing here? Do I hit this thing? Stay away from that box. At any rate, so they came over and we broke bread together and we laughed and we reminisced about old times. And I made, um, you know, Ed talk about anything but birds. I said, you can come up and talk to Dan. I don't know bird stories. You know, tell me where you were. Tell me the road you traveled on. But don't tell me about the birds. You know, and so at any rate, I, I'm pulling your leg, Dan. I, I, we talked about birds, too. But it was just great getting together, human beings breaking bread, um, picturing the image of God, sharing fellowship with each other, comforting each other in their times of need. And it, it just showed me what it is that God really, I, I, I think, wants other human beings to be there and be available to, to be a help 
to people along the road they may meet. Now the next stop we made along the road was in the city of Phoenix to some people that all of you know well. Yes, John and Rachel Smith. Uh, they were members of our congregation here for years and years and years. And we spent a couple of three days with them. And uh, there, there was nothing but, uh, but rejoicing and poking fun at each other's foibles in old age. And, uh, you know, when four old people get together around the table and they're playing cards and, and eating a meal and one thing and another, and they can poke fun about all these various aches and pains and this and that and, and so on. And, and it, it was just great to just sit down with folks that you've grown to love and appreciate over the years that are now kind of out of your life on a regular basis. And now and then you get to see them. And I think John and Rachel were planning to come back up again, maybe around Christmas time, uh, hopefully get back up to this area, pay a visit. So hopefully you'll get to see them then. Uh, but at any rate, we stayed and we talked. And every time this happens to me where you can just totally be relaxed and at ease around somebody, this has got to be a glimpse of the kingdom of God. This has got to be a glimpse when all of God's children in God's family are going to share fellowship for eternity and just, just be themselves because sin is going to be gone, because agendas are going to be gone. And you can just laugh and have a good time and do whatever you're doing together. And it's just a, a, a fantastic thing. And I, I always enjoy people like that that I've known and you can, like I say, feel totally relaxed around uh, because uh, it, you, just, uh, uh, you just get a glimpse of what God is all about. Well, now I want to go to some people that you won't know anything about. I want to take you to the town of Tularosa, New Mexico. How many of you know where Tularosa is? <laughs> Not a town you, you will hear of, <laughs> you know, in everyday travels. Well, if you went from Arizona, I think it's on Interstate 10, went into New Mexico, went off toward the center of the state, you'll come across Tularosa, uh, the other side of Las Cruces and out there getting into the middle of no man's land. Well, we stopped in the town of Tularosa to have lunch. And I say the town of Tularosa, there's not much to it, but fortunately there was one cafe. You know, I love that sign that says cafe. You know, you, you, you have diners and you have cafes and you have this and you have that, but you get into an old western town and it says cafe. All right, this has got to be the place. So Sandy and I go in and, and I don't know where everybody was. I guess really now that I think about it, it was more like about 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We'd had a late breakfast and we weren't hungry. And so we went and went and went. And then this, finally this place came up and we figured, well, we better stop here because after this, there isn't going to be any place to stop uh, with what's from what I can see on the map coming up on this road. So we went in this little cafe and, and a few tables around and this lady, uh, mid-50s or so, I assume she ran the place. I mean, she seemed to be the only waitress, the only person, the cashier and everything else. And she said, well, just have a table anywhere. And you, you know how refreshing that is? Just have a table anywhere. And you go to a restaurant around here and they want to usher you. I, I don't know whether they're trying to divvy out the people according to waiters and waitresses and and so on and so forth. And I, I'm learning something, though, about restaurants in this day and age in which we live of COVID. You, you can see a, a sea of tables out there that are empty. And you wonder, why aren't they seating us? You got all these tables to put us. And then one day, I was put straight on the subject. It's not a matter of you having a table to sit at. It's that we don't have any staff to serve you. Staff, that's, that's killing a lot of places. We don't have any staff. And so therefore, we can ration out only as many people as we can take care of at one time. 
and when we've got somebody who leaves, now we can take your place because we'll be staffed to take care of you now. Well, that wasn't our worry in Tularosa because we were the only ones in the restaurant. At any rate, this lady came, and I, I said, ah, people, now I'm going to mine these people. See, we got nothing around. There's no distractions. She's not working on anybody else. And I said, ma'am, if I might ask, how long have you lived in Tularosa? And she said, well, I came here with my grandpa and my grandma when I was about six, and I never left. I said, so you've been here, I said, approximately 50 years? Yeah, yeah, give or take. I didn't want to press her on how old she was. I thought that was a little forward to a total stranger, but I got a good approximation anyway. And I'll say, and I, this, is, this is the question I was leading up to. You may think I'm terrible for asking a question like this. But I said to her, well, what keeps you here? There ain't nothing here. I said, it's out in the middle of nowhere. I said, I'm curious. I don't mean any offense by it. I just want to know what keeps you here. And she thought about that in a minute, and she said, well, because it's home. Now, see, you can be out in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico, little old town, have very little contact with the outside world, but folks, it's home. This is where she grew up. This was her life. These were her friends. And people would, you know, after we were there for a little bit, some other folks drifted in, and she knew them all by first name. And the policeman came in, and he, he was getting coffee or something to go. No, he's getting I know what he was getting. He was getting a pre-made lunch for somebody down at the little jail. That's what he was getting. And so she, he, she had made him up a lunch, and this cop came in to pick up. And so she's talking with him, asking. Uh, <laughs> she said, well, is it pretty busy out there today? He said, well, yeah, I'm here picking up the guy's lunch, aren't I? I mean, we got something to do today. And, and you know, there just was really no crime there. And I got the impression this was a one-cop town, you know. And uh, there really wasn't much need for anything else. And I just listened to these people in this little town of Tularosa. And I said, but this is home. They know each other. What difference does it make? I said, I would much rather, the more I thought about it, be stuck here that in the middle of a few other places I've been, like maybe Newark, New Jersey, or New York City, or wherever else where the people are so crammed together you can't hardly even move. And so we talked about her town, her likes, her desires, business, this, that, one thing and another, and we paid our check and we moved on. But people, people in the little town of Tularosa, New Mexico, well, I'm going to come along here. I'll move the story along a little bit. And I want to come to Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, we were uh, at that point in any prolonged road trip, any of you will be able to understand this, that if we don't get some clothes washed soon, uh, we're going to stink. We, we were out. So we need to find a laundromat. And so came into this gas station because I needed to gas up anyway. And there's a couple of, of Mexican landscapers leaning on their pickup truck. And they've got their chainsaws and their lawnmowers and all this other stuff. I mean, you, you, you see these landscaping things. And so they're sitting up there gassing up their truck and they're, they're, they're talking to each other in Spanish. So I said, well, they probably know the town. So let's see if I get a, what kind of reception I'm going to get when I interrupt their conversation. So I walked over to where the two of them were, and I said, uh, excuse me, sirs. And they looked at me, and I said, we're just a couple of tourists passing through on our way back to California, but we really need to do some laundry. Where can we find a laundromat? And... This was something else that really uh, uh, amazed me about people that I met along the way. If you give people a chance, by and large, they tend to be quite friendly and helpful. 
particularly when they don't know you and they don't know any baggage about you and you don't know any baggage about them and there's nothing to predict. He said, oh, yeah, a laundromat. And he's talking to his buddy. He says, yeah, if you go straight up the main road, you're already on. He said to his buddy, he says, is it the sixth light or the seventh light? <laughs> oh, I says, it ain't going to matter anyway because when you get to where this road ends, I think it's light number seven, There'll be a T. You can't go any further. So you turn left. Now there'll be another sign that'll show you you're there for sure. You'll never see another thing like this in your life. So look real good. He said there's a four-story building. And it's got this blank wall on it. And it's got the biggest picture of a Holstein cow you'll ever see. <laughs> Covers the whole side of the building. So when you see the Holstein cow and the road runs out, turn left. Go about a mile and you'll see a Safeway on your right. You know you're getting hot then. Okay? And there'll be a Chick-fil-A just a little bit past that. And at that Chick-fil-A, look to your right. There's a little strip mall. And there's a laundromat smack dab in the middle of it. I said, sirs, I said, let's review this one more time. Light six or seven till the road dead ends. I see the whole steam cowl that I can't miss. Turn left. Go down past the Safeway, wait till the Chick-fil-A, it's on the right. Got it. Well, you know, just like they said. And that was the biggest picture of a Holstein cow I've ever seen in my life. I, I'll tell you that, it, it did fill the whole wall. So, we go in, here's the laundry, and we lug our big suitcase filled with all our dirty clothes in there, and so we got the laundry washing, and... I noticed out in front along the sidewalk of the laundromat there are these plastic chairs. You know, these cheap plastic chairs. And you, you didn't have to stay in the laundromat where it was hot and crowded. You could come out and sit in a chair. So I went out and sat in a chair while Sandy was waiting for the laundry inside. And I'm sitting there doing nothing, minding my own business. And I'm looking across the parking lot. And here comes this fellow walking toward me. And I looked at this guy and I said, uh-oh, this guy is going to come over here and ask me for money. I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. Because he, he, was, he was skinny as a rail, about 6'1", dressed like an old worn-out cowboy, worn-out boots, worn-out jeans, worn-out shirt, worn-out hat. And trust me, he looked worn out. And the closer he got to me, he smiled, and I noticed he didn't have but one or two snaggly teeth, and they were turned brown. And the way he was acting, I said to myself, if he ain't drunk, he's on something, I think. And so he kept getting closer, and he got to where I was, and he looked at me, and he said, you mind if I sit down? So he sat down beside me. And I thought to myself, well, I guess he's sitting there. And then some of these scriptures came back and I said, he is made in the image of God. And Jesus died for him, same as he died for me. So what right have you, God, not to talk with him and pass the time? And I decided I didn't have any. So I said, well, I said, uh, you live your whole life around here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he said, I've been here. And he told me some of the things he's done. How about you? Oh, I said, I'm just passing through. Going back to California. Wife's in there, you know, doing the laundry. I just figured I'd come out here and sit. And we chatted about this, and we chatted about that. And I kept waiting for the money. <laughs> but no money ever came. And the longer he talked, I realized he wasn't drunk. He just, well... I don't know. I, can't, I couldn't ever figure out what it was about him. But he was friendly enough, and he just wanted to chat and didn't have any agenda. So finally, after about 20, 25 minutes, I said to him, I said, well, I better get back in there and help the wife because I got the change in my pocket to feed the dryer, and she can't dry the clothes if I don't bring the change back. He said, yeah, you better do that because wives can get kind of mean if you, you know, stand them up in the laundromat. <laughs> like he'd been down that road a time or two. <laughs> so I went in the laundromat, and we got the clothes in the dryer and got everything going good. And I came back outside, and I looked, and he was gone. 
going. And about that time I said, well, I kind of feel bad that he was gone. I didn't want him to really leave. We were just getting to have a good discussion. But I thought about this old guy and wouldn't really have anything to offer anybody at first sight. I mean, he's old. He looks like he's half dead. He's got no teeth in his mouth. But he smiled. He didn't ask for anything. And I got the impression all he wanted was a conversation with another human being. He just wanted somebody to listen to his story. Could you sit there a while and listen to his story? And I wondered to myself, how many lonely people are there out there that we encounter every day? And really, they would just like somebody to listen to their story. They don't have any agenda. But could you just pause long enough to listen? And you know, the older I get, I get a great joy out of pausing long enough to listen. Well, the last place I'm going to tell you about that we stopped, there are two people here I want to introduce you to, I was in a little town called Beatty, Nevada. Beatty or Beatty, however it's pronounced. I think it's on either 6 or 95 that's going north out of Vegas. 95, I guess, maybe at that point. And you would know it if you're wanting to get into Death Valley from the east side. It's the jumping off point to go into Death Valley, which I didn't want to go into Death Valley. I don't want no part of Death Valley. It's too hot in there right now. Anyway, save Death Valley for another time. So we pulled into this little town of Beatty because it, we, we, we needed a place to spend the night. And I actually wanted to find a place about two towns back. But for some reason, it just didn't work. And so I got to this place. And here's this little mom and pop motel. And so pulled up and didn't look like there was anybody there. And I thought, well, surely they'll have a room. And so I go into the office. And uh, there was a lady sitting there. I, I guess probably owned the place would be my guess. But I don't know what to say about this lady. Um, well, let me describe her, and then I'll, then I'll tell you my observation about this lady. Uh, first of all, by the look on her face, it was evident she was in pain. I, I don't know what all she was suffering from, but the best way I could describe her is, is she was morbidly obese. I mean, to the place where even to stand up or sit down was a struggle. To make it worse, she had an oxygen, you know, these plastic tubes that kind of go from an oxygen tank you're carrying, and so she had to be on oxygen. But to make it worse, while we were transacting our business and I was getting a room, she withdrew the oxygen and lit up a cigarette. And then, of course, as she smoked, she had to hack and cough about every third inhale. And uh, I just didn't know what to say. I, 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 you know, she was friendly enough to me, although she never did smile because she was in too much pain. And I gave her my credit card and all that other stuff you have to do. And she gave me a key to the room, and it was a nice enough room, clean and all that. It was no problem. And so I, I just looked at this lady and, and it, it gave new meaning to what Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 4. I said, you, you talk about something, buddy, that needs some hope, some reassurance that at some point it's going to get better. A, at some point, this is going to end because she looked to me like she didn't really care whether she dropped dead, you know, the sooner the better. She was just barely getting along, barely getting along. And I just didn't know what to say. I, I tried to make a little conversation with her, but she didn't want to make conversation. I got the impression it was too much of an effort, just too much of an effort. But being in this little town, I, I, I just I said to the lady, I said, well, we're just here for the night. Can you, you recommend a place where we could eat? And it is a little town now, you know, generally your options are rather few, you know. There's not this argument that ensues sometimes after Sabbath services 
Get Charlie and Sharon and Linda. What are we going to eat today? Well, we could try this. Well, how about that place? Well, we haven't been over here in a while. No, I don't like that place. Let's go over here to this one. Well, let me tell you what. You're a little town like this in Beatty, Nevada. Your options, like I say, are rather limited. She said, well, she said, across the street down, about a block, there's this little place. It's got a catering truck out front of it. But there is a little restaurant behind it. And, and uh, from my experience, they serve pretty good food. Why don't you go there? Okay, so we get settled in. It's about supper time. So we drive down there and park. And man, when she said small, this was the smallest restaurant I've ever been in in my life. I mean, you go in the door, and, and this room is probably four times what that restaurant was. I mean, if you took right down through Armin, and cut it in half, that would be about it, right there. About, about, about right where Bill and Nancy, and that's the restaurant. There's just enough room to squeeze in four little tables. But fortunately, as luck would have it, there was nobody there anyway, just Sandy and I. And we walk in, and there was this, oh, I'd say about a 16-year-old teenage boy. And uh, I guess he was going to be the waiter and the maitre d' and everything else. So he says, well, you, you can sit there if you'd like. Okay, we'll sit there. And he came and brought us a couple of menus and eventually brought us some water and some silverware and a placemat because the tables were totally bare when we came in. And we gave him an order and he went back. I think it was mom and dad if I got the interaction correct. So this was strictly a family, little family restaurant. Well, there was about a, about a nine-year-old boy he was sitting at a table next to us, and he was watching some kind of a movie on this TV on the wall there. And it was one of those kind of movies, you know, uh, I don't want to say Guardians of the Galaxy, but along that theme where the parents were supposed to protect the Earth from the aliens. But the parents got overcome by the aliens, and the kids were forming together, and the kids were going were gonna to save planet Earth from the aliens. About, about, you know, 11, 12, 13-year-old kids. I mean, you know, and so there's this, this kid, he's sitting there watching this movie, and I never saw this movie before, and so I, you know, has my way. I said, bring me up to date on this movie. He doesn't look at me. He says, it's called such and such. Oh, well, what's it about? And he doesn't look at me. He just looks at the movie. And he starts to tell me what it's about. I said, well, so that we could have a little better conversation. What's your name? He said, my name is Johnny. And he doesn't look at me. He just looks at the movie. And so I start watching the movie with him. So I start carrying on this dialogue with Johnny. And Johnny, he talks. He answers my questions. Brings me up to date on all the characters. And we, we talk. But he don't look at me. He just looks at this movie. And, and I thought to myself, <laughs> well, that's all right. He's friendly enough. He's helping me. He's answering my questions. But here's this little kid, about nine years old, in Beatty, Nevada, watching this movie. Obviously, he's the youngest of the two kids. Mom and Pop are in the back. The oldest boy's waiting. He's just sitting there. I said, well, aren't you in school today? No, no school today. Well, as a matter of fact, now that I think back on it, there was no school because it was Saturday. That was the day we were there. So no school today, and he was probably bored, and I don't know where his friends were, but he's sitting at the table, and he was watching this movie that he'd probably seen 17 times already and trying to tell this old man what the movie's about. But I looked at this little guy, and I said to myself, I think I get an understanding of why Jesus loved the little children. Because this kid, he, he, um, he's utterly transparent. I mean, you, you wouldn't call him the friendliest, but then he's not unfriendly. He's helpful if you call upon him for help. And, and he's there, and he's helping me to understand this movie. And I just love the little guy, little Johnny. And I thought to myself, I can see how Jesus could love you. You know, you're kind of a lovable little creature in your own way. 
and, and it just, again, gave me an appreciation of people made in the image of God that God wants to share eternity with and about Jesus' reaction when the children came and the disciples wanted to rebuke them. He said, don't let the children come to me. Come on. And God reaches out to all kinds. And I thought to myself, and so should you. Whether they're old and sick, whether they can barely move, whether they're a little kid watching some sci-fi movie, no matter who they are, somebody who's in grief, somebody who has no particular problems, somebody who just wants to tell you their story, whatever, people, people made in the image of God. And on this road trip, I saw a lot of sights and traveled a lot of roads that I'd never seen before. But it was people. And I don't have time to tell you about any more people because my time is running out and I touched my microphone box again. So at any rate, so again, people on the road and what they can teach you about God and just the variety and the immensity of all these individuals and they all mean something to God. And God created them in his image. And I hope we can view them the same way God views them too. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, thank you so much for people on the road. And thank you, God, so much for people that are present with us week in and week out. Thank you, Lord God, for the fellowship of your church and the prospect of the fellowship with those that aren't in your church. And the thing that, Lord Jesus, you seem to set such a glowing example, it didn't seem to matter to you who was in or who was out, how old, how sick, how young, how whatever. They were people, and you loved them, and that's the example you set, and you ask us to do the same. So, Lord God in heaven above, I just pray that you'll inspire and help all of us to reach out to people wherever we may find them. And don't look on the dark side of people, but look on the good side and realize they're just going along in the journey of life, trying to make sense of it all too. So we ask your blessing on our dismissal, Lord, and thank you for all you give to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, if we can put up the words of the, of the benediction, because... I don't necessarily remember it either. All right, join me. May the love of the Father and the tenderness of the Son and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen.